the Bill of Rights begins with our political freedoms. Right? These five freedoms in the First Amendment protect us from tyranny, allow us freedom from the government in order to prevent tyranny and also in order to, for us to be able to stop tyranny from developing. Right to bear arms in the Second Amendment may well have been a similar political right. This is the right to bear arms in order to maintain a well-regulated militia, which of course was linked to this idea of the Revolutionary War and these militias fighting against the tyrannical king and Britain. The Third Amendment, the right against being forced to quarter a soldier in your home during peacetime, was very much a response to the Intolerable Act after the Boston Tea Party. Um, and those were considered a show of strength by Britain and, of course, a very tyrannical move on Britain's part. Now, we get into the rights of the accused at this point. Not everything in these amendments uh, is considered a right of the accused, but most of the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th amendments, the next five amendments, these are mainly considered to include the rights of the accused. It seems kind of odd, right? We have these political rights, then all of a sudden it's the rights of the accused. Why is this? Well, again, to prevent tyranny. Back when uh, we were British, and even before then, when there were no American colonies yet, uh, in England, in the 1200s, there was a baron's revolt. And what had happened is King John, at the time was considered not a very good king. And he kept raising more and more taxes to pay for these foreign wars that no one wanted. And the barons ultimately said, you've got to stop taxing us. This is too much. We're spending too much of our money. And John was like, I can do what I want. And he started accusing no noblemen who were against him, accusing his political enemies, of crimes. And he passed laws that said that if you were accused of a crime against the crown, your land can be seized. So what would happen is he would set up false witnesses and accuse people of things like treason steal, and take their land from them. And then he didn't need to tax them because he'd have all this land. Now, I said false witnesses. That's because at the time, they did not have a right to confront their witnesses. So they did not have a right to a jury trial. They did not have a right against uncompensated takings. So the barons revolted and forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. And this was something we learned about in our discussion of America before the Constitution. And the Magna Carta established these principles of common law, and they were extended over the years in Britain and helped govern us when we were the British colonies. One of the problems with the Intolerable Acts and Britain's other responses to our rebellion was that they removed our right to a trial of a jury by our peers. If we in the colonies were accused of a crime against the crown, we would be shipped back to England for trial, which violated this right of a jury of our peers. It also violated a right to any sort of speedy or local trial, right? So this became a big point of contention and one of the things listed in the uh, Declaration of Independence as a grievance against England. So when we were then writing the Bill of Rights, these different rights of the accused became really important because they are political rights. Rather than allowing the crown, or in our case now, the government, the president, Congress, whoever, to just sort of declare enemies um, as criminals and stop them from talking, stop to take their property, what have you, we now have protections against that. So these rights of the accused are generally considered great protections against tyranny. And many of them do stem from those original protections established in British common law, though not all of them. Some of them were um, new and created for this document itself.